Okay, class. So um, this is the beginning of chapter 16, <clears throat> which is the molecular basis of inheritance. And what we're going to do today is I'm going to do a solo lecture. Uh, a non-live lecture, but um, anyway, the purpose of this chapter is to sort of introduce you to what our genetic information is, which you guys probably know is DNA, um, and how that DNA is actually inherited, and how that DNA is copied, and some characteristics of DNA, and how it was discovered. So um, without further ado, we're just going to go ahead and talk about this. Um, and we've kind of touched on this before. So when we talked about that uh, fact that, uh, you know, in early, so, you know, remember Gregor Mendel uh, discovered these uh, particles that we now call genes that were transmitted from generation to generation and that each parent had two of these particles, but they only passed down one. And he showed this statistically. So all that stuff uh, was done by Mendel and his work was discovered in the early 1900s, like right around 1900. Um, and so, you know, scientists, once they discovered that, were, were quite interested in what uh, these things were. And they, they figured out by the 30s um, that, that our genetic material was on chromosomes. And they knew that chromosomes were made up of DNA and proteins. And you guys already know this. We've already talked about this several times um, in chapter 12 and chapter 13. And even earlier than that, even in chapter 6, we talked about this. And so you know that DNA plus proteins are called chromatin. And long stretches of chromatin are called chromosomes. And so, and these proteins are called histones. So this is nothing new. Um, but the reason I'm bringing that up is because uh, since DNA is wrapped around these histone proteins, scientists weren't sure what part of the chromosome was actually the genetic material. They weren't sure if it was DNA or proteins. And most scientists were on team protein. And the reason is, is that, and we talked about this a little bit, is that proteins have 20 amino acids. So they have a 20 letter alphabet. Um, but DNA uh, is only four nucleotides. And so that it's only a four letter alphabet. And so if you were a betting person, which one of these do you think you make a more complex language out of? 20 letters or four? And so most people guess 20. And so they thought, well, then protein must be the genetic material. And most people ignored DNA. DNA was just, it was like, what is it doing there? It doesn't really have much of a purpose. We don't understand it. It's got to be proteins. So there's a series of experiments that were done. Um, to sort of look at what DNA, uh, what was the genetic material, DNA or proteins. And the, one of the first experiments was done by this guy named Griffith. So remember I told you that dates aren't important, but people are. So you need to know about Griffith's experiment and I will ask you this on the exam. So Griffith performed four different experiments. And what he did was he took this bacteria called Streptococcus pneumoniae. So streptococcus pneumonia causes pneumonia. Um, and the way that it works is that this bacteria, we, we've learned about bacteria. Bacteria have a cell wall. Um, and I don't know if you guys remember this or not, but from chapter six, we talked about it has this, this it can have this capsid. And the thing about this capsid is, is that just like our cells, and this is a cell receptor, just like our cells, where there's lots of different receptors. And the receptors are what antibodies recognize. And just, just so you know, antibodies are made by B cells, which are part of your immune system. And what they do is they ran, it's, it, 
uh, it's kind of an interesting thing. And if you're more interested in this, then you should take a, a class on immunology or something. But these B cells, you have millions and millions of these B cells and they randomly make shapes. They make antibodies in different shapes. So they may, they may make a, a, a triangle antibody or a hexagon antibody or a circle antibody or just any kind of puzzle piece shape that you can think. And they're randomly going to make shapes uh, to try to fit into these receptors, into the surface of these receptors. They're looking for something that's born, that's not you. And so if this bacteria was in you, these antibodies would be created by B cells. And then one B cell might randomly make the right shape to fit in this bacterial antibody. And it would target it for destruction. Um, and that would happen by uh, T cells, like killer T cells. The antibodies themselves can bind these things together uh, and target them for uh, destruction by other immune cells. But anyway, uh, the point is, is that if these bacteria have these big capsids around them, the antibodies can't reach these receptors. So it, the, it can't, it doesn't know what to look for. And so it basically wrecks your immune system, your antibody immune system by having this capsid. And because it has this capsid, if you get streptococcus pneumonia, you're probably going to die uh, because your immune system can't defend against it because of this, this capsid. It's like a gel. Now, there are two kinds of streptococcus pneumonia. There is one that's called S that's smooth, and it has this, this capsid around it. And that's the reason it's called smooth. If you look at it under the microscope, it's nice and, and smooth. But there's, a, there's a, back, a form of this bacteria that the capsid is kind of wrecked on, and it doesn't form a full capsid. It's kind of a jagged, real thin, cruddy capsid. And what it allows is those receptors can stick out beyond the capsid. So now the antibodies can bind to this. So let's see, this is an antibody. It can bind to this and target it for destruction. And so this is the S form. And these are called R because under the microscope, they look rough because of this weird capsid. But when it, if you get the R form of streptococcus pneumonia, it, your immune system can protect you from it. And it targets it very easily and it kills it really quickly. And so if you have the R form, um, the, the white blood, your white blood cells can recognize this when they're targeted for destruction and eat them and throw them in the lysosome and digest them. And in other words, it can kill them. So our, our cells are quickly killed by the immune system. S cells are not, are not recognized and they uh, survive and, and kill you. All right, so with that said, Griffith was working with streptococcus pneumonia. And what he did was he took living S strain. So these, remember they're the smooth cells and they have that capsid, that capsule. And, and what he did was he injected living S strain into mice. And so from what I just told you, you would expect these mice to die, which they did because they, their immune system can't reach the cell surface uh, to protect them from this bacteria. He injected living R strains, remember they're rough, the capsid, the artist really didn't draw it here, but it's kind of sketchy, uh, some small capsid. Uh, I guess they're going to call it capsule here, but whatever, it's the same thing. And it, so he injected it into this mouse. And from what I told you, the mouse, you know, had a, a healthy immune system. The antibodies uh, targeted this. White blood cells come in and T cells come in and kill it. And your immune system protects you. So the the mouse lived, which is what we would expect, right? So no big deal, that's no, uh, nothing special. Now, you guys know probably from watching Survivor shows that if you boil uh, water for 10 minutes, 10 to 15 minutes, water boils at, at 212, 
uh, Fahrenheit, 100 degrees Celsius. And that's hot enough to disrupt membranes and do all kinds of nasty stuff. It could kill anything. And so if you boil the water, it's going gonna, it's gonna to kill all the bacteria and all the viruses that will wreck their DNA, most things, right? <clears throat> uh, harmful things. And so you're going to kill the bacteria. So that's what he did. He boiled these S cells for 10 to 15 minutes. And so they're dead, deader than dead. And he injected them into the mice. And lo and behold, the mice lived. And that's what you expect, right? If you inject dead bacteria, then it wouldn't affect the mouse. So this is the weird thing that he did. And nobody knows why, but he just did it. He took those dead cells, the ones that he heated and killed for 10 minutes, and he mixed those with living R cells. So remember the R cells, mouse lives. The dead S cells, mouse lives. So if you mix these together, what would you expect? You would expect the mouse to live. But that's not what happened. The mouse died. So what's going on? And that's what Griffith was, was uh, trying to figure out. So uh, he, went, he went a step further and he extracted the blood of the mice. And when he did that, he found living S cells. So here's a, here's a couple of possibilities, right? I mean, now, now we've got to come up with a, a hypothesis to explain what the heck's going on. And so, so we have dead S and we have living R. So, so if, if there's living S cells, then there's a couple of possibilities. Maybe these resurrected. So they came back from the dead and now they're alive. And Griffith didn't really think that's what happened. The other possibility is that the living R cells got some sort of uh, particles, right? Because we don't know if it's DNA or proteins, but it got something from these dead S cells that changed it. And he used the term transform. And this is a very important term because this is the this is the same word that we use if we're uh, putting a piece of DNA, say, from a, a jellyfish into a bacteria to, to make it glow green. We call that technique transformation. And it comes directly from Grif Griffith's words, just like the word cell uh, comes uh, <clears throat> from um, Robert Hooke. That we learned about in chapter one. So this word transformed is really big and this is uh, a super important word especially in biotechnology which is basically where the future of biology is headed. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right. So this is just what I explained. The Griffith is there's some material, right? Some particles that were coming from the, the dead S strain and being transferred into the R strain. And he called this transformation or transforming factor. Um, he didn't know what the genetic material was, but what he did know is that whatever was being transferred was the genetic material. So this sort of got everyone all excited about what's the genetic material. And it wasn't until 1952. So the reason I'm giving you these dates is because I want you to realize that in 1945, we detonated two atomic bombs in Japan. And so that was seven years before this experiment to figure out what our genetic material was. We didn't know what made humans humans until after we developed the atomic bomb. So Hershey and Chase, again, the names are important. You need to know this experiment who did this experiment, but you don't need to know the date. I'm just giving you that for a reference. They were the first ones that showed DNA was the genetic material. Um, and they did it by using these viruses. So there's, uh, viruses are real specific. Viruses are specific for what it infects. So like, for example, you a dog virus you would not get because 
dogs and humans are too different. Like uh, uh, a monkey virus you could get, or maybe a pig virus uh, because it's similar to humans, but um, dogs and cats and stuff like that, you wouldn't get a cat virus. Uh, and so these T, they, they're called T even viruses. These T even viruses, they infect specific bacteria and the bacteria that they infect are, are uh, E. coli. All right, so the T even means it's like two, four, six, eight, and there's T odds, but they chose this T even virus. Um, just like uh, us, the, back the virus is made up of both DNA and proteins. This is what the virus looks like. So this is the protein part, all of this coat is made out of protein. And inside here, this black stuff is DNA. All right, so this is a bacterial cell. It's kind of, it looks like a lunar lander sort of. And what happens is it, it lands and it, in, it like a hypodermic needle and injects the genetic material into the bacteria. Now, this says it's DNA, but nobody knew that at the time. So I'm just gonna cross it off. We'll just say whatever it's injecting would be its genetic material because what it happens is, is that once the genetic material gets inside this bacteria, so let's say this is the virus, and it's putting its genetic material in there. So once that genetic material gets in there, it makes a whole ton of other viruses. Um, you know, and then we get all these viruses made inside the cell, and they keep they keep getting made until the cell basically explodes. And so it dies because it can't do homeostasis. And then those viruses go on and infect other cells. Okay, so Hershey and Chase knew that whatever T2 was injecting had to be the genetic material. So how did they figure it out um, if it was DNA or protein? So they did something that's interesting and, uh, you know, because they paid attention to Bio 81, 181, they knew this. So back in chapter four, I made you guys memorize uh, the, uh, functional groups and there's the sulfur functional group. And chapter four. And you also had to, to uh, you're supposed to know the phosphorus functional group. So the, remember the sulfhydryl uh, bonds there to give strength and they're only found in proteins. So sulfur is only found in protein. And Phosphorus is only found in DNA. And remember, it's negatively charged. That's why I wrote it like that. So they grew up these uh, bacteria and viruses with radioactive sulfur. So remember, we talked about isotopes in chapter two. So normal sulfur is 32, radioactive sulfur is 35, which means it has. Uh, three more neutrons and that makes it unstable and you can detect this uh you know you can use a geiger counter you can use uh, x-ray film any of those ways you can detect to see uh, if it's radioactive or not and so they he used uh, they used radioactive uh sulfur what happens is is that the outside coat got labeled with radioactiveness right and the DNA didn't get labeled because there's no sulfur in DNA, so it couldn't be labeled. And they mix it up in a blender. This is, we talked about cell fractionation, same deal. And uh, when they did that, the viruses, the, the whatever was on the outside got disrupted. The, the bacterial cell is actually pretty, uh, the cell wall, it's made out of, cell, uh, well, not cellulose, but a similar 
to cellulose and and so it's pretty sturdy it's not easy to break open and if you talk to any geneticist when you try to extract dna out of bacteria with a with a cell wall it's not easy to do so putting these in a blender wouldn't wreck these uh bacteria and then what they did was they spun it in a blender and you remember from chapter six anytime we do that we get two phases we get the pellet and then we get the liquid on top which is the supernatant and so they tested the supernatant it, you know the 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 shells of the virus would be in the supernatant uh, because they're smaller and then the the bacteria would be in the pellet and the and the virus coat would be in the supernatant and so they tested it so this they tested the supernatant and they found out that the supernatant was radioactive so that means that the protein wasn't in the bacteria. And because of that, it had to be the DNA because these viruses are only made up of protein and DNA. But like good scientists, they wanted to verify it by doing a different experiment um, just to make sure that their, their hypothesis was correct. And uh, what they did was they grew a different batch and they grew this in radioactive phosphorus. Um, so radioactive phosphorus has extra neutrons and makes it unstable. And uh, the artist drew it in blue, but it's, you know, it's just radiation. And so here it's showing you that the DNA is being ejected into there, into the cell. So same deal, right? The coats are not radioactive, only what's inside the bacteria. And remember the pellet, the bacteria is still attacked. So the pellet contains the bacteria with the genetic information from the virus and the supernatant contains these protein coats. So this tells you that uh, since uh, phosphorus is only found in DNA, that DNA, since it's in the, in the bacteria and it's radioactive, it could only have come from the virus and it can only be DNA. And therefore DNA has to be the virus's genetic material. So Hershey and Chase were the first ones to show that DNA was the genetic material, at least of these, these T-even viruses. <clears throat> All right, so there are a bunch of other experiments after that that showed DNA was the genetic material. The uh, scientists tested gametes. You guys know this from, uh, from chapter 13 and meiosis that you only have half the amount of DNA in your gametes as the as your somatic cells. And so that showed that uh, DNA was the genetic material. Uh, also, the amount of DNA doubled in cells prior to mitosis and meiosis. And so we, we know that from the cell cycle and S phase. Um, so, so everybody abandoned this protein ship and we're on team DNA. Uh, most scientists that believe that DNA was the genetic material. So the next step was to figure out, well, how does this four letter uh, nucleotide make super complex things like humans? Um, and a lot of people uh, actually were involved in working this out. So there's a chemist named Shargoff, uh, uh, the, Maurice Wilkins and Rosalind Franklin were X-ray crystallographers, and then Watson and Crick were biochemists. Uh, most of these people lived in England. Um, these were at uh, King's College. This is a neighboring college. Uh, so just a little bit about this. Shargoff was interested in DNA. Um, he didn't really care that DNA was the genetic material. He was just goofing around looking at DNA. And what he realized that when he looked at living organisms that had DNA in them, which all living things do, except some viruses, uh, he, he, so excluding viruses, any living thing with DNA, with double-stranded DNA, uh, he noticed that the, the percent of A always equaled the percent of T. 
and the percent of G always equal the percent of C. And that's going to be important later on in, in figuring out the structure of DNA. Uh, X-ray crystallography is really important because when you're talking about super small molecules, you know, DNA is, I've done this a long time, so I can easily draw this out. Um, but it's basically a base, a sugar and a phosphate group and hydroxyl on the number three, hydrogen on the number two. So it's only a few atoms and you, there's no way you could see this in a microscope. Um, even big pieces of DNA, you couldn't see in a microscope. So what they did was they, they you had to crystallize DNA. Uh, so you had to extract it from a living system and you guys did that with the strawberries. And then you had to take that and form a crystal of it, which is not easy to do. It's super hard, um, just trust me on that. And then once you've got a crystal of it, you would take a, a piece of, of, of a radioactive material uh, that emitted x-rays and you would shine it through the, the your DNA crystal. And then that would create, when, it, when the x-rays struck the DNA, it would create a pattern, an image, like you, like kind of like an x-ray of your bones. So you can't see the x-rays. It's the, the film that, that detects the x-rays and how they pass through. And that's how you see the, the thing. So this, uh, it looked, it ended up looking sort of like this. And so, you know, obviously that's a double helix. I'm just kidding. Um, so there are a couple of things that were really hard to do. It was hard to make a crystal of DNA. Rosalind Franklin was really the only person that was good at doing this. And uh, she was also really good at reading uh, these films and figuring out these shapes. So she was an expert at not only crystallizing DNA, but reading the image that DNA created. And, you know, you got to remember back in the day that the, the x-ray source wasn't like the dentist office where it's like contained and they wore lead and then like there was no safety standards back then so they basically just put a chunk of you know radioactive material that emitted x-rays and set it in like a camera looking thing and sh shot it at uh these crystal structures of dna the best that they could but that stuff went everywhere and in fact rosalind franklin died from cancer probably from all this x-ray exposure that she uh, was subjected to, trying to figure out the, the structure of DNA. And Watson and Crick, uh, they, they were friends with this guy, Maurice uh, Wilkins, um, who worked with Rosalind Franklin at King's College. So I'm about to tell you an interesting story because most people know who Watson and Crick are, but they don't know who Maurice Wilkins and Rosalind Franklin are. And it's, it's kind of a shady thing in science. And I'm, I'll, I'll ask you guys what you think. Um, but so, so let me just tell you the story. So first let's talk about Shargoff. So Shargoff knew that the structure of DNA, he knew what the nucleotides of DNA, right? A nucleotide is the base, the phosphate and the sugar. Um, we talked about this, but he, when he studied everything, percent T's equal percent A's and G's equal C's. So on the test, if I said, uh, you looked at an organism and the percent of A's was uh, 10%, what is the percent of G? Well, A equals T, and that means T is also 10%. So together, they're 20%. The rest of the stuff must be 80%. And half of that's G, so that's 40%. And then uh, G's pair with C's, so C would also be 40%. So if I give you one of these percentages, you, using Shargoff's rule, you should be able to calculate any other percent of uh, A, G, C, or T in an organism uh, based on this 
percent A equals T and G equals C. All right. And um, all right, this is the image. It's called image 51. It has no relation to area 51. It's just the 51st image that she took of this. Um, to a person that's experienced with x-ray crystallography, uh, this was obviously a double helix. I don't do x-ray crystallography, so I wouldn't know what that was. It looks like X-Files or something to me. But um, she knew and uh, from the patterns the x-rays made in this, on this image. All right, so here's the deal is that this is in uh, around 1956, 1957. So Maurice Wilkins worked with Rosalind Franklin. Um, they worked together, just like, you know, I, I teach uh, Bio 181, and I work alongside someone that be, teaches Bio 201. I'm not their supervisor. They're not my supervisor. Uh, you know, the department chair is, but that's an elected position. Anyway, they're equals, right? But this is kind of back in the day when it was sexist, uh, and people, a lot of people didn't think women should be in science. Um, in fact, it was pretty bad back then uh, the, in the cafeteria at the college. Uh, only men were allowed to dine in the cafeteria. That's how crazy it was. So Maurice Wilkins naturally thought of himself as Franklin's superior because he was a man and she was a woman. Um, so he treated her like she was uh, an employee of his, and he felt like he could do whatever he wanted. So what happened was, is he was friends with uh, Watson and in Watson and Crick. They're all buddies. They the there was a just a like an hour train ride between their schools. They would eat together and hang out, and they concocted this plan because Wilkins knew that Franklin had that image. So he he told Watson and Crick to come to the college. And so this is a note that was found by Maurice Wilkins. It says that, uh, I think you will be interested to know that our dark way, that I don't know why he would like to call Rosalind Franklin that, but he called, there's a book he wrote and it, it talks about her. Leaves us next week. So she wasn't going on vacation. At last the decks are cleared and we can put all hands to the pumps. It won't be now long now, uh, Maurice Wilkins. So Watson and Crick uh, came to King's College to look at the images because Rosalind Franklin was gone and Maurice Wilkins, like they shared a lab, so he had keys to it. He basically broke into her lab drawer and gave Watson and Crick the pictures uh, of that fi uh, 51, you know, that uh, photo 51 and all of her notes that said that it was a double helix. So Watson and Crick, took Rosalind Franklin's uh, information and then they went back to their school and they worked on modeling for a month of, of DNA and they couldn't get it right. So guess who they called to come help them? Rosalind Franklin. She thought that they had already figured out the structure of DNA, so she was already behind and she was like, well, I, we might as well help the betterment of mankind by figuring out how this works. And so uh, she agreed and helped them model DNA. So that picture in your book that shows those two guys modeling the DNA, that famous photo, that was really Rosalind Franklin's model. She made it, I mean, fixed it for them. And that was all based off of her information. So uh, I'll... This is just what I just told you here. Um, they didn't. They didn't tell Wilkins uh, either. And then they posed the paper, and the paper was by Watson and Crick. And that's why you never heard of Rosalind Franklin or Reese Wilkins, because Watson and Crick were the only ones that were on their paper of the structure of DNA. And so, of course, Maurice Wilkins had a complete meltdown over this because he basically gave them the information. Uh, and they double-crossed him, and they said, without mentioning 
uh, Maurice Wilkins or Rosalind Franklin. He balked at it. These guys got the Nobel Prize. Wilkins said, that's not fair because I helped by stealing, I guess. And then, uh, so they added uh, Wilkins to the Nobel Prize recipients for discovering the structure of DNA. Rosalind Franklin had already died from uh, cancer. And so they don't give the, the Nobel Prize to people that have already passed away. So posed to humorously. Uh, so she never got a Nobel Prize for this discovery, but she was the one that actually did all the work and she's the one that should get the credit. So here's what James Watson said in 1994. This guy is super pompous and he really hasn't contributed much to science without you know, actually stealing. But here's, this is what he said at a commencement speech. There's a myth that Francis and I basically stole this structure from the people at Kings. I was shown Rosalind Franklin's x-ray photograph and woo, that was a helix. I'll tell you right now, this dude does not know anything about x-ray crystallography. He couldn't make a, the structure of DNA. He couldn't crystallize it. And he certainly couldn't read x-ray uh, crystallography of DNA. He knew that there was a helix because it was handwritten in the, in the margin of the book next to the picture. So anyway, and then, the, then he went on to say a month later, we had the structure. Wilkins should have never shown me the thing. I didn't go in the drawer and steal it. It was shown to me and I was told the dimensions. Okay, so I'm just gonna ask you guys, if you went and took someone's paper that they wrote and copied it from them and then used it and didn't cite them or give them any credit, what would you call that? And the answer is you'd call it plagiarism and any university would call it plagiarism because, and plagiarism is wrong. It would get you expelled, but guess what? It got Watson and Crick a Nobel prize that is still to this day, never been taken away from them, even though they stole it. Um, so, you know, I, this just infuriates me because this goes every against everything I think about science and everything that I feel like is should occur in, in the scientific world. And I think these guys are a couple of crooks. They don't deserve the Nobel prize. Uh, they don't deserve the, the fancy uh, appointments that they have or any of that stuff because they basically stole all the information and used Rosalind Franklin uh, to for their success. All right, so so I'm gonna I'm done um, with my soapbox. And in 1957, these two crooks, I'm I'm Crick, I mean Crook, Watson, uh, James Watson and Francis Crook, sorry, Crick, came up with a model. Um, the ones that we use in the in the lab and in, in most labs, and that was based off of the data and calculations of Franklin. You don't need to know this. Uh, I'm just telling you so that you know that DNA is really small, two nanometers across, um, 0.34 nanometers between the bases. Um, so uh, there's one turn every 10 nucleotides. Again, you don't need to know this. What you should know is that A's and T's have two hydrogen bonds, which we talked about, and G's and C's have three. And we talked about the origin of replication is made up of A's and T's because it's weaker and it's easier to break. Um, the, you also should know that the strands run anti-parallel to one another. That means that, so you probably don't remember this, but let's number the carbon. So this is a number one, two, three, four, five. It's a pentose. Um, and so the, this is the, what we call the five end. Uh, sometimes we put a prime on it. So this, this end is the five prime end. And it's just a notation that scientists use to keep track of what direction it's running. This, again, we do the numbering one, two, three, three, four, five. And so this is what we call three or three prime. And so this strand goes this direction, three to five. And we can do the same thing here. I'm gonna number it upside down, one, two, three, 
four. This is kind of hard. And this is the five carbon. So this is the three prime end here. And it goes to the, again, we can number it one, two, three, four, five. This is the five prime end. So DNA, this is how scientists write it out. One end is five to three. That means the other end has to be three to five because it runs what we call anti-parallel. This is the space filling model. So this is what DNA actually looks like. If you shrink yourself down to an atom, these are the clouds that the, the electrons fill. Um, and that's pretty much what I need, want you to know about this. So you need to know that it runs anti-parallel. One end is five prime. And on that five prime end, you should know that this is a phosphate, right? And on this three prime end, you should know that that is a hydroxyl group. Right, and you learn that in chapter four, remember? So this is a hydroxyl on three prime, and this is a phosphate on five prime. Phosphate on five prime, hydroxyl on three prime. All right, so you should know that uh, five prime is phosphate and three prime is hydroxyl. The two strands, DNA is double stranded. Strands are held together by hydrogen bonds. The, A's matched with T's, two hydrogen bonds. G's matched with C's, three hydrogen bonds. All right, so this is really the only thing that Watson had contributed to science as far as I'm concerned. And, and what they did was they made a guess. So they guessed about the way DNA was copied and there's three ways it could happen. So you have these two strands. I'm gonna make the original strands red and I'll make the new strands green. All right, so the DNA would, uh, could get copied like this. So you would get two brand new strands off of these old strands. The other way that it could, so this would be called, uh, conservative, which basically means you conserve the original double strand of the end. The other way it could be copies is if you open the strands, right, and they split, and then uh, the new strands are copied using the old strand template. So this is how we would get our two copies of the end. Remember, this happens in S phase. And so this is called semi conservative uh, because it's, sem it's semi conserved. One strand uh, is conserved, and then there's a completely new strand made off of that. The last way that they envisioned that DNA was replicated is that the, D the original DNA kind of blew apart. And so you would get these new pieces that were sort of piecemealed together. Um, off of the original strand. And it would look like this. And this method of DNA replication is called dispersive. All right. So Watson and Crick chose this, right? And that seems the most, most realistic. If you're gonna photocopy a book, you'd open the book and then copy what's on the page. Even if you're gonna hand copy it, right? Uh, you wouldn't keep the book closed and then magically copy it. And you certainly wouldn't shred the book up. So anyway, these guys, the crooks uh, figured out that it was semi-conservative and it turns out they're right. Meselson and Stahl did an experiment that showed this. So they took heavy nitrogen, nitrogen 15. Um, and so remember we have uh, the original strands are conserved. And so the, so if uh, you originally grew the bacteria in heavy nitrogen and then you transferred them to light nitrogen, remember DNA 
uh, has nitrogen, the bases have nitrogen. And so the new strand would be made out of white nitrogen, like this. So this would be N14, and this would be N15, the original strand. So this one is heavier, right? Nitrogen 15 is heavier. It's got one more neutron. Not by much, but it's heavier. And so if you centrifuge that out, you guys know that the heavy stuff goes to the bottom. White stuff goes to the top. So if it was conservative, you would see two distinct bands, right? One for this double strand of DNA and one for this. This would be at the top. This would be at the bottom. Right, but they didn't see that, so they could you could rule out conservative. They didn't see two bands. The other way, or so remember, we have uh, the new strand is built off of the old strand, and so we would have equal parts of nitrogen fifteen and nitrogen fourteen. So these would weigh the same, roughly, and so you would only expect to have one band because they're mixed together, same weight. Um, and so that that's what they did see. So we couldn't rule that out. But dispersive, if it was kind of blown up, right, then, then, then it would roughly weigh the same as well because it would just be like sort of a patchwork of heavy and light nitrogen. So you would expect to also get one band. Um, if it was dispersive. So what they did was they went to the next generation. So imagine if, uh, if this is right, right? Then uh, in the next generation, you would get two new strands, but this is, the new, this is the new strand, but that would separate and this would be built on that. And then you'd get one old and one new strand like this. And then the same thing would happen here. So in the second round, you would expect two bands because this would be lighter than this. This has one heavy nitrogen, one light nitrogen. Um, so you, the, new, the new, new, new strands, these would be all light nitrogen. And then these uh, older ones, so this would separate, these would separate. And the new strand, the green one would be built. And this would be mixed light and heavy, so you would get two bands, right? If it was dispersive, if these blew up, they would just keep blowing up and they would always weigh the same. So you'd just get one band. Well, they didn't see that. They saw these two bands in the second round of replication. And so the, the Meselson and Stahl were able to prove uh, or you know, support the hypothesis that DNA replication is indeed semi-conservative, which means the two strands open up and then a new strand is copied off the old strand. All right. So how does DNA replicate? Well, it's a complicated process. We're not gonna get into all of this, um, but Remember, DNA is a double helix, so it has to open up, just like opening a book. Like if you can't, if you didn't open a book, you wouldn't be able to copy it. So the DNA has to open. That requires enzymes because remember, we can't just heat it up. We have to get delta G to be negative. And we talked about this in, in, in chapter eight. Uh, but we. Remember, it's not the enzymes that, do, that make delta G negative, it's what they do, which in this case would be like adiphosphate. That causes delta G to change because it bends the shape and, and makes it weak, like breaking a stick. And lots of proteins, right? So the double helix is untwisted and I'll just tell, I'll just be a spoiler. So the main enzyme here is called helicase. And we know it's an enzyme because it ends in ASE and it works on the helix. That's why it's called helicase. So basically think about it as a rubber band that you've twisted. And if you want to untwist it, you would just twist it in the opposite direction. So that's what helicase does. It finds 
the, these origin of replications, remember they're A's and T's because those are weaker and it twists it because it's easier to break it open there. Um, once the helicase opens the DNA, it's like two magnets, right? The hydrogen bonds are attracted to each other. So they want to go back together. So you need these proteins called single-stranded binding proteins. Uh, and kind of think of it as your hand. So if you, like, you had two magnets and you held them close together, they would stick. But if you put your hand in between them, they would have a harder time sticking together. So that's what these single-stranded binding proteins do. They basically act as a barrier to the hydrogen bonds re-sticking so that the DNA say, stays separated. Now, um, a primer is a short piece of DNA. So to do this, I'm gonna have to sort of write out some fake letters. So I'm just gonna say A T G C A A T T G C A. Remember one strand is five, so this is three. And we'll pretend it's separated. So this strand would be three. And if this is an A, that's got to be a T. And if this is a T, it's got to be an A. Next one is G. And I'm just going to go through this pretty quick. But just remember, A pairs with C, uh, T and G pairs with C. And it's anti-parallel. So if this, remember, this has got a phosphate. This has got a hydroxyl. This has got a hydroxyl. This has got a phosphate. And, and they're being held apart right here in this example by the single stranding binding proteins. They, the hydrogen bonds want to reattach, but they can't. And so uh, that's what's going on. Now, uh, the enzyme that copies DNA is called DNA polymerase. And you did this in the last lab. Um, the one that we talked about was TAC polymerase from Thermus aquaticus which is the bacteria it comes from. And the reason that we use it is because it's thermostable. Um, in the inside of the body, uh, we use heat instead of helicase because it's easier, right? Remember the Delta G formula says, inside the body, we can't heat stuff up because it would change the shape and kill things. But if we take the DNA out, the easiest way to get Delta G to be negative and to get these two strands to come apart is to heat it up and the molecules move faster and the bonds become weaker. Just think about it as like you're, you hold on to you know, a kid that's jumping around. The faster and harder they jump, the harder it is for you to hold on to them. And that's what uh, temperature does to delta G to make it lower. So anyway, um, the polymerase, all polymerases, they're like a, think of it as a train, right? So a train needs two tracks. Well, this is only one track. And this is another one. And they're separate from each other. And now, if they were together, the polymerase could bind to this and potentially copy the DNA. But since they're apart, it would be like trying to run a train on a single rail track. It would fall off. The polymerase will continuously fall off until we put down a short piece of DNA called a primer. So that primer you can order from a company and I'll show you in a second. Uh, you just you do, just call them up and you'd order it. Actually, I made this hard on myself. I'm gonna do this uh, backwards. So I'm gonna switch this five and this three. So I'm gonna make this it's just easier because we're used to reading left to right. So I'm going to make this three prime and I'll make this five. And if that's three, then dang it. That's not a phosphate and that's not a hydroxyl. All right. So this is five prime and this would be three prime. Uh, so this end would be the phosphate, this would be the hydroxyl, this would be the phosphate, this would be the hydroxyl. 
Okay, so you could order a short piece of DNA um, and you would order that normally five prime to three prime. And so you would order this as a T, A, C, G, T, T, you know, just a few nucleotides. This would be the phosphate and this would be the hydroxyl end. Uh, sorry, and this is the three prime end. All right, so let me just show you real quick how you can order this. So um, I'm gonna stop sharing this and then I will screen share. All right, so I just did a Google search for DNA primer order. Uh, lots of different companies make these primers. Um, this is where I prefer to buy them from IDT because they're cheaper and they're faster. So you can go to products and services and um, you can buy these are oligo means oligomer, uh, which means many parts. Um, so we want a piece of DNA, single stranded DNA. Um, and so we're going to get it in a test tube. We don't need very much. This would be enough to do, uh, to make primers for hundreds of tubes. And your body builds this, uh, by the way, with a, an enzyme called, well, I'll show you in a second. If we were doing this outside of the body, we would order the primer. Um, it's 37 cents a base. And so like, let's say that I was going to order that. It would ask me what the DNA sequence is and, and five prime to three prime direction. And I would go ahead and type it in. So I don't know if you remember, but our primer sequence was T A. C, G, T, T, and uh, we would just order it lab ready. You could add, you can add like fluorescent tags and all kinds of stuff. And we'll just call this bio 181 F because there's going to be a forward one and you'll see there'll be a reverse one. And we add it to the order and this is probably all right, so it's not long enough, so I'm just gonna make up some letters. Usually it has to be 18 bases, so it says 15 bases. Normally, uh, statistically, you, you could get uh, 18 base nucleotide and it would r only randomly match like one in a, in a trillion random letters. But anyway, so here's the, cost, it cost you like 10 bucks uh, to order this uh, piece of DNA that you could, you could copy any gene um, that you wanted to. All right, so I'm gonna stop sharing this. And I'll go back to our PowerPoint. Okay, so in your body, so if this piece of DNA was outside of the body, we could order it. But in the body, you can't really just up and order primers. So your body synthesizes this with an enzyme called fittingly primase. So primase makes this primer. And what's weird is RNA is really unstable. So if I were to order a primer, I would order DNA because I know it lasts a lot longer. Um, and that's why these COVID vaccines don't last very long because they're made out of RNA. RNA is really super unstable. Um, the Pfizer and Moderna vaccine, not the Johnson & Johnson one, that's made out of protein. But anyway, uh, primer, primase, for whatever reason, puts RNA as the primer instead of DNA. And it doesn't make uh, energy efficient sense, but that's how it is. 
And so remember, there's no uh, T's in RNA, there's only no T's. There's only U's. So this is what the primer would look like inside the body. And it would be made out of RNA. Everything else is the same. All right, so the DNA polymerase now has two strands or two tracks that it can bind to. I'll make the polymerase a different color. So let's say this is the polymerase. Now it can bind to the double-stranded DNA. Um, and remember in chapter, chapter five, the reaction to add one nucleotide to another nucleotide to make molecules is called dehydration. And so you can't do dehydration on, a, on the phosphate end because there's no, you have to be able to make water. You have to make, you have to have two H's and an O. And you can only make that from hydroxyl because you need O's and H's. Um, and that's why DNA can only be copied on the three prime end. It can never be copied in the five prime direction because it can't, the enzymes can't, polymerase can't do the dehydration reaction it needs to build a, a strand of DNA. All right. So the new nucleotides are put into place. Remember, those are done by uh, dehydration. by DNA polymerase. And then the DNA, remember we talked about it being checked for accuracy at that uh, G2 checkpoint. And then we have to fuse the backbone together to make a new helix. And I'll show you why that is because it's piecemeal together. So this process is rapid and very accurate. Five, 50 to 500 nucleotides are added per second. It makes an error rate of about one per trillion nucleotides. Um, sorry, billion nucleotides. I was like, that's a little, that's a lot more accurate than I remember. So that is one per billion error rate. Since you're three billion nucleotides. Every time your DNA is copied, the polymerase makes three errors. So you're going to get three mutations. They could be anywhere. They could be in a breast cancer gene or they could just be in an area of DNA that's not important. It's just a random chance. Um, and that's why a lot of cells are in G0 because if you don't replicate your DNA, you have less likelihood of increasing your error rate. All right, so DNA is going to unwind at the origin of replication. Uh, remember, we talked about that already, so I'm not going to go into that again. Uh, it's called ORI for short. We talked about this in mitosis as well, remember, um, in binary fission with bacteria. So it's about 350 base. This BP means base pairs. That's the number of nucleotides. So there's about 350 A's and T's and long stretches uh, that the helicase, that enzyme that opens DNA recognizes and it will bind to there. In eukaryotes, we have chromosomes that are millions of nucleotides long and it would take forever to copy your DNA. So you have multiple origins of replications. Um, and each of those can be opened independently of the other. Uh, in this case, the artist has drawn three, but I assure you that there are thousands of origins of replications on every one of your chromosomes. And DNA replication proceeds in both directions simultaneously, uh, making, so once the DNA is open, it makes this, uh, at the origin of replication, it makes what we call replication bubble because it looks like a bubble. And these are what we call replication forks. There's one on each side of the bubble because it looks like a two-pronged fork. Uh, 
like here and here. Uh, and so these are just terms you need to know, replication fork, replication bubble. And these things are gonna get bigger until they come together. And then you get two new strands of DNA. This is an electron micrograph. Each one of these is a replication bubble. All right, so like we said, helicase opens at the origin of replication. And then this, once it's open, the single-stranded binding proteins come in and they hold the DNA apart. So they, they the helicase makes the bubble, but the single-stranded bi binding proteins keep the bubble. Um, and we just talked about the replication forks and the in the bubble. It's important to know that DNA is copied in both directions simultaneously on both strains. So um, that presents an, actually a problem and what we're gonna talk about next. I will maybe in a couple of slides. So DNA polymerase, right, once the, so we, we have helicase, it recognizes the origin of replication, makes the replication bubble, one of these strands is going to be three prime. This one would be five prime. So that's three, this is five. And that's five, this is three. Um, and then we're going to have the new, uh, the, the single strand of binding proteins. I'll make them purple. They're going to come in here and they're going to hold the DNA apart. And then remember the polymerase can't do anything without the primer. So we have to lay down a really piece, short piece of DNA. Well, in the cell it's RNA. Um, I do this a lot in the lab. So uh, this would be three prime and this would be five prime. And then you'd have another primer on this strand which would be if that's five this is three and if that's three this is five so that's the primer and now the polymerase has the the two requirements it has that three prime hydroxyl group and it's double stranded dna the primer plus the original strand those are what the polymerase requires so once it has that the polymerase doesn't care what the dna is it just copies it so if it sees an A on the original strand, it's gonna put in a T. If it sees a C, it'll put in, you guessed it, a G. And remember, we have to do the, we have to uh, do the dehydration reaction. So there's a hydrogen on this phosphate. It combines here and water comes out. Um, the phosphate molecule is broken. The DNA nucleotides are what we call triphosphates. So we call them nucleotide triphosphates or NTPs. If they're DNA, they're called deoxy nucleotide triphosphates. So this is what DNA nucleotides would be. RNA nucleotides would be written like this. And then that N, that N in DNA stands for A, G, C, and T. The N in RNA stands for A, G, C, and U. Okay, uh, so this is the, how the new strand is built off of the template strand. All right, so hopefully you guys know this, five prime is a phosphate, three prime is a hydroxyl. Um, this is the numbering system, so this is the five in, if that is the five in, this is three. If this is three, then this is five. A pairs to T, G pairs to C. And you should have done that in the lab um, that was due uh, this week. So you get some practice at this. Anyway, so that means DNA is anti-parallel. Um, that means that the replication fork runs in different directions. Uh, one is five to three and three to five. So again, let me just draw out the fork. Here's the bubble. This time green is gonna be the original strand. Um, so I want the primer to be red, five prime, three prime, 
This one would be And then um, if that's three, then this has to be five. And that end has to be three. So if that's five, this is three. That makes sense. And then this is three, this has to be five. So the new DNA strands are gonna be copied uh, off of this hydroxyl in this direction, right? And in this direction. But they're also copied, you know, the also copied this way on this strand. But that can't happen because DNA polymerase can't add to a phosphate group. It can't do the dehydration reaction. Same thing here, right? This can't happen. But it does, and I'll show you how it does that. All right. So really quickly, um, an RNA primer, like we talked about, is laid down by the enzyme primase. Uh, that's shown here in pink. Primase lays down short uh, RNA primers. I would never do this in the lab, but it's, it's done in living systems and nobody knows why, like I said. So you have an RNA primer, it's incorporated. Once you have this double strand, the polymerase can jump on, which is shown here, and it can add the new piece of DNA. Remember, it only goes, it can only go this direction because on the three, it has the OH, and it needs that to make water to do the dehydration reaction. Um, so this, uh, this is called DNA polymerase three. It's the main polymerase. It was the third one discovered. That's why it's called three. And then this one is DNA polymerase uh, five. Sorry, I was distracted. DNA polymerase one. And this is DNA polymerase Uh, this is DNA polymerase that um, was discovered first, uh, but it actually removes the RNA primer and replaces it with DNA because you don't want RNA mixed in with your DNA. That would make your new strand of DNA unstable because RNA is unstable. So it has to get replaced and a, another polymerase does that. So polymerase one replaces the RNA primer with DNA. Polymerase three is the main polymerase that does most of the main copying of the DNA. All right, so here's, this is just one fork. And remember there's another fork on the other side, but I'm just gonna show you with one fork. So uh, this is the five prime end, so this is the three prime end. If that's five, this is three. If that's three, this is five. And so we would have our primer here and let our primer would be five to three. And it can only copy in this direction. So DNA can only be copied five to three because it needs this hydroxyl group. Uh, and that's true, even though I told you it copies both strands. The way it does it is it does small fragments. So it's still copying it, but it's copying it in the opposite direction. This is five and this is three. So it's copying it in these little pieces. So it copies a little piece and then the polymerase jumps back and copies another little piece. And then the polymerase jumps back and copies another little piece. So that's this would be the first piece. This would be the second little piece. This would be the third and so on. And so a guy named Okasaki discovered these little pieces of DNA. <clears throat> and the reason he discovered them is there's an enzyme <clears throat> that uh, links these pieces together. It's called DNA ligase. So he was studying a bacteria that didn't have DNA ligase. So it couldn't link all of the little pieces together. And so when he ran it out on a 
on an auger's gel, kind of like you guys simulated in the previous lab, he saw all these little pieces of DNA um, in that bacteria where ones that had ligase, they just had one big chromosome. So anyway, <clears throat> that's why they're called Okazaki fragments. Um, and it's DNA ligase, the, the enzyme that links all the Okazaki fragments together um, into one continuous strain. So this strand, and I can, I'll just draw it out of here. So you can hopefully see it a little better. So we're just looking at one fork. And so the example is this is five and this is three. So the primer that would be laid down would be here. And it would be five because that's three to three. And remember five to three is the direction that DNA replicates because it needs that OH. OH. Um, so this, because once it's started, it can continuously go. This is called the leading strand, which is shown here. Uh, the other strand that's made in pieces is called the lagging strand. So the other strand, the, this would be three prime. This would be five prime. So the primer would be would be here. And so this would be three prime, three prime, and this would be five prime. It can't go this direction. It has to be copied like this. So that's why it's copied backwards, right? It's copied this way, and then it comes back and copies another section and comes back and copies these Okasaki fragments. So that is called discontinuous, right? So continuous is the leading strand. It's always five to three. Uh, discontinuous is the lagging strand. And that one is always three to five. So it goes backwards. Now, the, if we look at the other fork, it's opposite. So the other fork, if we put a primer down here, this is five prime. So this end would be three prime. This is five prime. So the primer would be five prime here and three prime here. It couldn't copy this way. So here, this is the leading strand on the left side of the fork, on, on the left side of the bubble, on the left fork. On the right side of the bubble, it's the lagging strand. This on the left side of the bubble on the left fork, this is the lagging strand. And on this side, so this is five, this would be three. And it could copy continuously this direction because it's copies in the five, five to three direction. So this would be the leading strand on the right fork of this bubble. So they're kind of flip flopped. And the, the, the leading strand is continuous, right? It's not made in parts. The lagging strand is discontinuous. It's made in parts. Uh, we talked about Okisaki fragments, so I might ask you on the test, what are they? They're just the fragments that are made on the lagging strand. Um, then they were named after that dude. And uh, DNA ligase, I might ask you on the test, what's the purpose of DNA ligase? DNA ligase is the enzyme required to stitch together short pieces of DNA. It can't link that little last bit of the, the gap between the five and the three prime section of DNA that's being built. All right, so uh, it, this will be the last slide that I'll cover and, and then we'll, I'll, I'll pick this up uh, on Tuesday. So this is just a summary slide of DNA replication. Um, and if you guys are confused about this, I recommend that you do look at some YouTube videos. 
I have some videos in Canvas uh, under pages that, that uh, show DNA replication as well. And you can see it in real time and how this has worked because it's, it's hard to animate this process. But um, so this is a, a, a artist bubble. Remember the direction of replication is this way. So this is the left fork. There's a right fork over here that we're not looking at. If this is five prime, then this has got to be three. And if that's three, this has got to be five. If this is three, this has got to be five. And if that's five, this has got to be three. So just remember that DNA replication can only go from five to three. So this has to go this way. And this has to go this way. That makes this the leading strand, this the lagging strand. These are the Okasaki fragments. These are the RNA primer. Uh, this is the RNA primer is laid down by primase. And remember, there's two different polymerases. There's a three and a five. So let's just do a summary slide here. We'll look at the leading strand and then we'll look at the lagging strand. So the lead, remember, the first thing that happens is helicase recognizes the origin of replication, which is made up of A's and T's, uh, and opens it. And it does that by twisting it like a, a opposite direction that you twist a rubber band. Um, if you had it twisted, then single stranded binding proteins come in and they bind to hold the two strands apart. Step three is uh, primase has to lay down a primer, and that primer is RNA. So priming is done by primase on the leading strand. Priming for the Okazaki fragments is also done by the same enzyme. So primase does the leading and the lagging strand. The only difference is it only has to prime once on the leading strand where it has to prime multiple times on the lagging strand. The next step, once the primer's done, done remember that provides the double-stranded DNA. The primer does this and the free three prime hydroxyl group. Once that's in place, the DNA polymerase will copy the DNA. It doesn't care if it's in the test tube or in the body. Uh, it doesn't care uh, what it's copying. It could be a gene for cystic fibrosis or a gene that makes uh, uh, jellyfish glow green. Uh, it's going to copy it. And, um, and that's really cool because that means that we can copy any gene in the test tube no matter what it is. Um, and as long as we use, as long as we add this stuff in, but in a test tube, we don't need this because we use heat instead. We still need primers. We don't need primase. We buy the primers from a company that synthesizes it. And if you take biochemistry, you learn how to do that. Also organic chemistry, you learn how to do that. The polymerase then copies the DNA. And remember, it can only copy in a five prime to three prime direction because it needs that hydroxyl group to do the dehydration reaction. Uh, so elongation is done by DNA polymerase. And then the polymerase is gone. It's already started copying. So we got to replace that RNA primer. So remember uh, DNA polymer, so this is polymerase three. And DNA polymerase one, removes the RNA primer. We don't have to worry about this in a test tube because we don't use RNA for a primer, we use DNA. Uh, so anyway, and, and then the last step, which is, I ran out of room, but step six is DNA ligase has to seal the gaps together to make one continuous piece of DNA on only on the lagging strand, not on the leading strand uh, DNA. So replacement of RNA primer by DNA is done by DNA polymerase. And I told you specifically that's DNA polymerase one. And then again, ligase 
that's only on the lagging stream. You don't have to worry about it on the leading stream because there's no pieces. It's one continuous piece. And then this is just showing you a drawing of how it works. So like what I drew before, the lagging strand on this right fork is on the top, the leading strand is on the bottom and that flips. So on the left fork, the leading strands on the top and the lagging strands on the bottom. <clears throat> All right, so uh, like I said, I'm gonna end here. You guys should uh, check out some YouTube videos on DNA replication. Just go to YouTube and type in DNA replication. There's a ton of them. Um, it'll help you visualize this better. Um, and like I said, there's some links in with uh, Canvas under pages as well from some ones that I've selected. So uh, hopefully, uh, you really can't ask any questions, but if you want to hit me up during office hours, you can. Uh, so have a good one, and I'll see you for next lecture on uh, a week from today. <laughs>